Today's topic discusses some of the cutting-edge technologies of the last few years, quantum computing. Imagine that. Instead of 10,000 years of calculation, you can do the same calculation in just a couple of hundred seconds on Google's new quantum processor. What does it mean to fabricate atoms and what are qubits? Today's guest, Dr. Eric Lucero, will give you a crash course on quantum computing, but more importantly, will share how they work with art to communicate the potential of quantum computing. Let's start. We are being told to choose between the left and right brain, between studying art and engineering, between creative and analytical thinking. Our society tells us that art and business are not connected. But what if society is wrong? What if it misleading us? The good news is that understanding what art is can bring us to a new revelation. Art does matter in innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship. And with the help of this podcast and its guests, you as well will learn that art is not an object. Art is a mindset. You are listening to the Artian Podcast with me, Nir Hindi. As we look further into the future, there are types of problems that classical computing will not be able to solve in a reasonable time. Quantum computing represents a fundamental shift because it harnesses the properties of quantum mechanics and gives us the best chance of understanding the natural world. Achieving our quantum milestone was a tremendous accomplishment, but we are still at the very beginning of a multi-year journey. Hey, welcome back. I'm Nir, the founder of Dartian, a company that applies an art mindset in business environments to foster innovation. And in this podcast, I hope to reveal how art can help us create better, more creative, and more humane organizations. The recording you were just listening to is a recording of Sundar Pichai, Chief Executive Officer of Alphabet, also known as the parent company of Google. Pichai spoke last May at the Google I.O. 21 conference. In this conference, he actually introduced the new building for the quantum computing team in Santa Barbara, California. Today's guest is Dr. Eric Lucero, and Dr. Lucero leads Google's quantum computing services. He is one of the lead scientists on the AI quantum team that demonstrated humanity's first beyond classical computation on the Sigmore quantum processors. Sound too technical? Please bear with me and I promise you will learn as well. I did it myself. Now, you might ask, why is Dr. Lucero on a podcast that discusses art? Well, not only that Eric is a passionate photographer who has produced a portfolio of iconic photos documenting the evolution of the quantum processors, but as a tech leader, he also founded the Quantum AI Artist in Residence. Hey, Eric. Hey, how's it going, Nir? Great. Welcome to the Artian Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you. I mean, I'm super excited about our conversation today. I learned a lot from you. And first of all, thank you for taking the time to explain to someone like me what is quantum computing. I'm super excited about our conversation today about quantum computing, science, art, photography, and much more. Been looking forward to it. Thank you. Eric, maybe you can introduce yourself briefly to our listeners so they will get the chance to know who you are. For sure. My name is Eric Lucero. I'm a quantum mechanic and I work at Google. I lead the uh, quantum computing service at Google and I'm also the site lead for uh, Google Santa Barbara. So all of the operations in Santa Barbara. I guess many of us hear about quantum quite often in the last few years. And before I will ask you why we hear about it so often recently, I want to ask you, what does it mean quantum computing? For sure. And I think the important things to take away are those two words. What, are, what is quantum and what is computing? So we know computing is all around us and we have paradigm that we call in this world now, we call it like a classical computing. That is computing that's been uh, built on basically all the classical laws of physics. And that's delivered us the cell phones. It's allowing us to have this amazing conversation virtually. And now if you add to that quantum, quantum is what we understand is the best theory that describes nature. And that's been about the past hundred years that we've now understood how the very fundamental level, how nature behaves. So when you combine these two, you can think about, well, this is now basically taking how nature works and we're going to combine that with computing. So 
Physically, what we're doing is we're looking out in nature to see are there ways that we can use what nature provides us as tools to do com computation. Now, we do that with actually engineering systems. So you could think of taking an atom. So you go out and look around and you think of back in your maybe your chemistry class um, and you remember these electron shells, right? So those are these like individual moments where these electrons get excited from, say, a, a spherical state to these p orbital states. And if you took those two states and you said, let's just make a, a quantum bit from that, right? It's a two level state, this s or p orbital, or if you like the electron, like the electron spin, spin up or spin down is a two level quantum state. And from that, I can now build up what's called a quantum bit. All right, that's a short for that is qubit. And that's the fundamental building block for quantum computation. Now, what we do at Google is we actually design these with circuits. We design it with superconducting circuits. So we're, in a sense, fabricating atoms, okay? These fabricated atoms are essentially the Lego building blocks that we use to stack up to make these circuits that then become a quantum processor and ultimately a quantum computer. I know, at least for me, it's kind of difficult to understand the technical terms behind it. And I'm a person that relates much more to examples. Why everyone is so excited about quantum computing? What are the potential of it? Do you have some examples you can give me? Yeah, this is a great question. And I think it captures a lot of people's imagination and inspiration to think about what will this new tool be able to do for humanity? As an example, one of those is the ability to simulate nature and specifically the ability that we might be able to discover better materials, better materials say, for better, more efficient batteries. Um, that would be a huge win for our just our energy consumption and use. And of course, there's the idea of being able to come up with better medicines. The idea in pharmaceuticals, um, just being able to predict these molecules in a better way. We kind of encapsulate all of that in this world around quantum chemistry and material research. Another one is around search, which you might appreciate just, you know, why Google might be interested, right? Being able to improve search. And we know that there are, there's actually known algorithms like Grover's algorithm that actually allows us to perform Uh, search in a way that actually gets a speed up that would only be achievable using a quantum computer. That's a great point because that's what I hear in the news. Everyone speak about the speed and I'll just give an example and please forgive me for my ignorance. Let's assume to develop a medicine takes on average 10 years, even though this year we proved that we can do it even faster. How quantum computing can help us with this development of a medicine? Yeah, a good way to think about this is there's some of these problems that, including those that we're, say, we're searching for better medicine or materials research, that rely on the idea of being able to simulate the entire molecule. Now, that requires a lot of memory, like hardware or RAM, this random access memory, to just store the entire description of the problem. Today, the, the size of those problems, we couldn't even simulate, say, the caffeine molecule because it's just so large, right? And so if you're wanting to talk about much more, more complex ones where it's around, say, medicines, just being able to store, we call that kind of the wave function of that system, would just overwhelm all of the computer's memory that we have today on Earth. So it's totally intractable. But if you have a quantum computer and you can actually map that to that system, now you can watch how that system evolves naturally, and you can actually simulate what really happens. And then we can take measurements and actually explore what goes on in that system and actually compute the like kind of like the ground state of that system and know some new ideas from that. Whereas before, it's completely intractable. It's not even a matter of time. It's not only that we wouldn't have the space to do it or the computational power to do that. Google claims it has reached a key milestone using a quantum computer to complete a task that a classical computer couldn't manage, achieving what they call quantum supremacy. This would be the first time that a quantum computer has definitively beaten the best conventional computer. Google reached a certain point that from what I understood, it's important point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so why it's exciting and what is this point that you achieved at Google? <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely excited about quantum computing. I've been doing it my entire life, basically at this point, my entire career. And um, 
the achievement that our team at Google showed a year ago was this ability to show a beyond classical calculation. What does that mean? We have our modest quantum processor of 54 qubits. And with that, we were able to do a particular calculation that no other computer on earth could do. And we showed basically by extrapolating how long it would take the largest supercomputer on earth to do. And that's around 10,000 years to do the same calculation that we did in a couple hundred seconds on our quantum processor. Wow. That particular problem and that particular, this horizon that we've really, really crossed over basically introduces this whole new era of computing. And this has been coined the noisy intermediate scale quantum era. Unpack all of that since there's a lot of words there. (laughs) What it means is that we're now in area in humanity and our computational abilities that we can now use these quantum systems. They're small, so they're intermediate scale. They're noisy still. That is, they still are prone to what's called decohere. So you set up your quantum computer and you start to let it evolve, but there are errors that happen. And those errors will actually cause the system to lose coherence and decohere. So you have a limited amount of space-time volume to do your computation, right? So we prepare that system and we're able to run it, you know, millions and millions of repetitions and times to get good statistics of what the answer is but you still only have a limited amount of computational space-time volume to do this experiment. And you are trying to break this limitation of time. Well, what you're trying to do is trying to grow that volume, okay. right? You're trying to, in, by adding more qubits, but also by adding and making sure that they are of high quality. That is how well you can control them and how long they actually stay coherent for. When we showed this with the Sycamore processor a year ago, that allowed us to, again, it, it's what opened up. It's what dawned this NISC era. Before that, everything that you could do on a quantum processor could just be simulated on your laptop or your desktop or a supercomputer if you have access to one. And what we showed was that now the game has totally changed. You basically have to have a supercomputer to even kind of be in the game to do these simulations. And now, more importantly, you need to have access to a quantum computer. First of all, I'm positive that every time you go to a dinner with non-scientist people, (laughs) you have a lot of explanation (laughs) to do. And I'm definitely grateful because I learned a lot from the conversations we had. And probably listeners now asking themselves, why art? How art over (laughs) here (laughs) relates to to quantum computing? And for that, I want to take you to your college, back to your own college day. Mm. And I think over here... Art kind of merge in your own personal and later in your professional life. Tell me about it. Yeah, thank you actually for that uh, that trip down memory lane. I grew up in Colorado. I went to a college, uh, the Un- University of Colorado um, in Denver, where we shared a campus in the urban area. And one of the highlights of that campus, not only what that I got to you know do my bachelor's in engineering and in physics there, but was we had one of the world's largest and the last wet lab for photography. Um, So we still used chemicals in a dark room. And I remember having in my senior year there, the access to that and I took a class and um, I'd had a a spark when I was even in high school to, to be playing around with a camera. And I then walked into this class and I just was totally transfixed. And I ended up spending a good part of my last year in college getting into photography. And I began to shoot the things that were around me, which was a lot of science. I worked in a superconducting lab. It was called the Squid Lab, where we made these really sensitive devices to actually study cryogenic dark matter. So it was part of this search for this called a CDMS project. And so I had a lot of these beautiful objects around me. And I wanted to really memorialize what I had been doing was important to me at that time in my life. And so I started to take pictures. And at the time it was all black and white, but I got to go into a photo lab and do that, right? And at the time I didn't really appreciate how much that would then later become something that I had used even in the clean room when I was making devices in my graduate studies and on in uh, industry. My pleasure to uh, have Eric today defending his thesis. 
and we were excited to be able to ask some questions. Because you don't have any connection to art. You study pure science through all your career. And by the way, guys, you can read scientific papers by Eric. <laughs> so just type, type in there, right? You, you study pure science. Yeah, I studied uh, electrical engineering and then physics, and I did a PhD in physics. My studies are pure science and engineering. I took a class in photography, right? And I began to just hone that skill. And I noticed the parallel to the things that I was able to do with photography and, and the way even to explain what we do when we make uh, silicon devices or, our, or even our quantum processors. It's very similar process to working in a dark room. And I loved that connection and the same kinds of, you know, technique that we need to have in, in cleanliness and watching what happens through each step and all of the kind of, you know, even the, the mise en place, if you will, setting up your workplace so that you can actually perform the tasks that you need to do in a particular order and with exquisite care. And I think you have to have that when you're in a dark room. That's a very creative space when you're making your photographs. And the same thing is true when you're working in a clean room, when you're actually, you know, making, say, quantum processors. Now you took this uh, photography and I don't know, is it now a hobby of yours? Yeah, I mean, if, if I may, I would, it's a hobby. Of, I remember having a couple of showings of my work and I've uh, been able to have work published and, you know, people have purchased my work. So in some ways, it's a little bit more than a hobby, I guess. But more importantly to me was that it was a way to describe and to show others even the scientific work that I am around and I'm privy to, stuff that I've done and this access that I have to technology that most people in the world have never even seen or even heard of in some cases. And a picture can draw any audience in. If you've got a really well-composed photo, it's usually the right kind of conversation starter. It's the kind of thing that someone wants to now ask you a question. What am I looking at? What's going on in this photo, right? And I was noticing in my own scientific study and career that scientists didn't always think about composing a beautiful photograph to explain their work. They would instead spend a lot of time composing a beautiful graph, right? Or, you know, to show the data. And of course, that's very important as well. And I'd spend the time to do that. But if you can land a really beautiful photograph, you can capture everybody's imagination and audience, not just the scientists, but everybody. And then you can have the conversations about what it is that you're doing and looking at. So now actually you are using photography to advance the work of science that you are doing? Yes. In which way? I'm, I'm interested to hear about that. Yeah. As an example, if you type in quantum processor or quantum computer in Google, a number of the photos that come up are the photos that I've taken of these devices. In fact, the Sycamore device, we have an image of that uh, processor, which is one of many things to look at that comprise a quantum computer. You know, there's another image I have of these refrigerators that we use to cool these devices. And when you look at that refrigerator, I mean, it looks like a sculpture. It's almost like this chandelier, this beautiful piece of art, right? But that's a physical instrument that we've built. And being able to show a beautiful image of that I think helps people, again, draws them in and wants them to ask questions of what it is that they're looking at. Am I looking at a steampunk squid of some kind? <laughs> like, what is this? What is this beautiful piece that I'm seeing? Right. So to me, that's that's an example of where we, we make sure that we're also sharing the things that we get to see in our everyday life that almost become. I don't want people to take it for granted. It's not just pedestrian. I want you to be pulled into this lab with us and see what it is that we are building. And Eric, I have a question. Can we see these photos? Yes, I'd be happy to share with you, Nir, a nice collection of these and have the audience that's listening today be able to look at these photos. Be happy yeah. to share. Yeah, let's do it. So guys, check the show notes uh, to see uh, Eric's photos that he takes of all the quantum computing parts. I don't know how to define it. Components. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the quantum computer itself, the quantum processor, all the technology and things that we are building in the lab. Obviously, you produced a portfolio of iconic photos that uh, documenting the quantum processors over the years. And I'm interested why you're actually doing it. You already mentioned to kind of communicate. Are there any reasons or even how people respond to this uh, photo? I know when I saw it, I said, wow, it's like, yeah, as you mentioned, 
even the chips themselves are designed and sculpted in a very symmetric, beautiful way. Yeah, I, and I love that. I love, for me, it's not only a, an opportunity to drop in late at night after a day of work or, or a long week or something and to just be with these systems that we've built, that you know our team has built, and to take a fresh perspective of not only you know all the work that we're putting in to get this into a into a system but also looking at these individual components and celebrating those and celebrating the work done in every one of those pieces and trying to get a perspective that can do that like in some of these like with the processor there's this beautiful diffraction of light that happens and you get these amazing rainbow colors right and that's due to the fact that we use very small superconducting lines of metal. So these are metal lines, maybe a, the thickness of a hair that defines these lines. And we repeat that a bunch of times, hundreds of times across the device. And so when light hits it, you get this really beautiful diffraction pattern and it looks like a rainbow. And it, it, it is, it's, I mean, light's diffracting across that chip. I mean, this is beautiful. And that's because of the design that we've laid out on this chip. Yeah, I'm positive. Listeners, you cannot see me, but I'm smiling because you already have noticed that Eric has the ability to describe it beautifully. So not only that he has a photography skill, kind of a poetry skill, Eric. Oh, you speak about much. quantum computing, which, by the way, that's a great opportunity to mention that in the Google Quantum Summer uh, Summit, one of the things that I love that you guys did is that actually you brought a rapper and a poet to actually speak about quantum computing and maybe even we will hear it. Yo, check it out. Yeah, this is a rap, a freestyle that I don't write down. I'm sorry, but I pump it up now. Don't bring the hype down. This is how I do it with the flow. My brain's got the color code. Yeah, I got the plants. Like Ryan, that's how yeah, I Yeah, that was, you know, I, this is a testament to the entire team. And I think how important it is to have artists working with scientists. And that was, you know, I think that's a, a public demonstration of how much our team values it. Right. This is a typically a, a symposium where we speak of all of the great things that you can do with a quantum computer. But what a great way to kick it off with a wrap or to close yeah. up the, the evening with a wrap. Right. And to bring in a world renowned poet. And she's got these just this this control of language that is better than our control of qubits. It's fantastic. It was just so inspiring to listen to and what she had dropped into when she was starting to learn about quantum computing and how that made her think about the world. You took it one step further and you invited Forrest Stern, who was a guest in this last episode of our first season, to become kind of a creative collaborator, artist in residence, and Google quantum computing. So before we even discuss the work you and Forrest are doing, how did you two actually met? <laughs> yeah, I, I learned of Forrest's work while he was a planet, which is a small, it's a, well, it's a large company now as a startup, yeah. the satellites. And, you know, I have a, a colleague, I have colleagues of mine at Google that um, we actually learned about planet because there was some incubation at Google for that technology. And they'd actually had, we had a satellite a startup kind of inside of Google, and then that kind of rolled out to planet. And so I had colleagues who knew of it and they'd seen the pictures that I had taken of hardware of our lab. And they were like, you know, you need to talk to this guy at, you know, at, at planet. And I remember basically cold calling Forrest, sending him pictures and being like, you need to come work with me. Like, here's some pictures of what quantum computing looks like. I know you're into this like space art stuff, but come, come be a quantum artist. <laughs> Amazing. So yeah, I went and cold called him and I asked him to have lunch with me while I was in the Bay and I'm based in Santa Barbara and I was, you know, sometimes I get up to Mountain View where kind of the, the headquarters is for Google. And I took a chance to go up to San Francisco and meet him uh, for lunch. And that was where I basically um, recruited him to come work with me. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Eric, before I will ask you, what are you doing over there? Let's take a short break. Sounds good. Would you like to work personally with Nier to develop and grow your artistic mindset? At the Artian, we work with organizations and individuals to achieve greater success. Through our art-based leadership sales and innovation training, we show organizations that there is another way of thinking and another possibility of acting. Visit us at www.theartian.com. 
That is T H E A R T I A N dot com to learn more. We are back with Eric Lucero talking about the quantum computing and art. And just before the break, Eric, we started to speak about you and Forrest. And now you have quantum artist. Uh, Forrest moved from space artist to quantum artist. Why you wanted to have an artist in a, such a scientific environment? Yeah, I think it's just as I was describing earlier, the importance of of being able to describe kind of my own work and our team's work through the photographs of the things that, you know, where the technology and the artifacts that we build in the lab. I think it's really important that we understand the just gravity of what quantum computing is for the world and appreciating that artists are the ones that really do a great job in providing a narrative and helping everyone in the world understand what it is they're looking at. In some ways, artists, people to scientists to the punch, right? There's even in, I think of chefs that we had amazing chefs in the world that created these flavors and all these amazing dishes that we've enjoyed in our lives. And only later have we understand in science, really the underlying reasons and taste buds and all the ways that we under in experience. Uh, food and delicious and amazing things, right? So for this case, for our team at Google, it was important for me to, to get ahead of this and to say, we've got, we owe this to the world to be able to explain this and to show this, this technology as a beautiful thing. This is a human creation and it's working with, you know, it's harnessing nature, it's working with nature and being able to describe that in a beautiful way. I think that's very important. So that's one, that's, those are some reasons. I think another one is that you want to have this intellectual diversity on your team, right? And not just a bunch of scientists trying to push on in one direction, but also to have some heterogeneity to the way that we all work together and think. And having an artist in residence, actually in the labs with us, working shoulder to shoulder or being around all the other scientists in our lab, that is a really important thing that I wanted to get ahead of. And I wanted to have Forrest, again, you know, I look at the things that Forrest had done and his connection to nature and how much he celebrates that. And I look at that is exactly the right person to start this project with. So you talked about, if I kind of summarize it, you mentioned external values that the artist in residence brings like the education of what you guys are doing and communicating it and internal things like kind of maybe spark curiosity and and creating new conversations and one of the things you also did and I'll be happy if we can talk about it because I love the way you frame it you also invited Forrest to take part in the designing of the new building now one of the things that you said I didn't want to have an artist in there just because we have a empty walls but I wanted him to take really part in the design of the building tell us about how it works and why you wanted forest to actually be involved in this process yeah well thank you for the really nice summary and also that that question so what was uh, about three or four years ago in my mind uh, was building a new building for our team and we started that process and With my team and also with you know we hired uh, architects on that team and as we start to build out that space and laying it out there were a number of things that we wanted to make sure that we got right for example an important part to any deep thinking scientist or engineer or creative type is the ability to be able to think and have that uninterrupted time and space to do that there's also an important touchstone of To our technology and our group is that we build hardware. So in our current space, it's much like a garage feeling where you get up from your seat, you walk a few steps and you're into the lab. Well, as soon as the team grows and the space gets bigger, you're naturally going to have these distances from you and the lab. So we really wanted to make sure that we had almost like a fishbowl setup where you can look and peer into the lab and you're not ever very far from it. You can still see it and almost experience it, and then it's a short walk to get into the lab. So when we started to arrange the space and look at where we had, it's a beautiful high bay lab, 30 foot ceilings with this glass area around it that you can peer in and see the lab space. There was an important part of geometry and how we wanted to arrange really the focal points as you move through the space. So not only as a visitor, not only as an employee, that you experience the space and you actually go on that same journey 
of what we've done when we've built the space. So when someone actually enters the space, they walk through what's called a museum walk. And that museum walk actually takes you through all of the sequences that we take to build the quantum computer. You see these individual components in these systems to get there. As you come past that, you see all these pieces and they all start to come together. And then as you open up into the lab, you'll see these amazing works of art. That, those are our cryostats and they are the murals that Forrest has painted. And these murals are the things that actually communicated to the architecture of that space, the building and the technology that we're building. So Forrest was there when you know we would sit with the architects. He was there when he would sit with my team and we would go in and we describe the spaces and what we were trying to achieve. And now we have this beautiful space. We can't wait to share with the world, right? What this looks like and feels like to do science and to build a quantum computer there. The roadmap begins in our new data center, which we are calling the Quantum AI Campus. Let's step inside. Michael, are you there? Hey, Sundar, how's it going? Yeah, I'm here and I'm excited to learn why I'm here. And I'm guessing that's why he's here. Hey, Michael. Hey. I'm Eric, lead engineer. Sounds here. amazing. I like can't to wait to share it. And Eric, I'm interested, what do you feel or how the team actually respond to these uh, initiatives that you brought an artist and now you have these murals and you have different activities with an artist? I think it's a very positive response. I see the team is very creative already. And I think this taps into other ways that they may not always exercise those parts of their brain. And in some cases, it heightens it because some of them are already that creative and they have these artistic outlets or they have other folks that they want to bring in. And that's, that's what we're starting to bring up is how do we start to actually scale this process? That's exactly the idea is to now bring this and let it be an inclusive environment where our, our scientists are also working with artists and not just Forrest, right? To grow that and for Forrest to help to direct and curate. This to me is a great way to grow not only the science and engineering, but the artistic community as well in quantum computing. And I'm positive that you get some critiques or maybe cynical response and people say, Eric, why do you waste time and money on this? <laughs> How do you deal with that? Or what would you answer? Or what are well, you answering? Yeah, I invite them to take a look at what we're doing. And usually it doesn't take much to, sh to once you start to share the, the artifacts that have been created or for them to experience and walk there with you, uh, that minds change pretty quick. So people are kind of transforming from being critique <laughs> of the arts to kind of supporters? I believe so. And, you know, in any situation, you're going to always have, you're not going to be able to please everyone. Yeah, obviously. There's going to be, an artist is an important one, an important and experience that's, it's very individual experience, right? And it can evoke very different emotions for everyone. And it's important to hear those out and to really listen to how people feel because of that. And our, my intention in doing these things has been to inspire. It's to bring people into a space where they work, that they feel inspired to do and build the future. And if those are not the things that they are feeling, I want to hear from them and also understand what we can do to help celebrate the work that they are doing, right? And they know that the intention is there. And so now it's a little bit more about these perspectives that you have to help shape and not everybody understands or can critique art or even speak about it in ways. So you sometimes have to drop in with them to hear what are the words they're using to describe their work and how can I bring that out in some really great art in around us. Do you have example like this? That Because I, I think you, you're saying things that kind of spot on to some of the things that I talk about because we often hear about vision of a company and how to translate it. And one of the things you just mentioned is that yeah, I want to hear from my people what is their vision and how I can actually translate it. So do you have projects that you are already working that helping bring this vision or aspiration that your team has in yeah. using uh, yeah. the work of uh, Forrest? So I spoke a little bit, I briefly mentioned it earlier on this museum walk, and this is just beginning, you know, it's in the early stages of taking the artifacts that have been built by our team, if you, you take a piece of hardware, if you present it in a way that celebrates it like a piece of art, all of a sudden that piece of hardware has 
elevated. It's almost graduated from, yeah. oh, it was just this thing on a table to, wow, I need to take a moment and kind of contemplate all of the work, the blood, sweat, and tears that went into making that thing, right? That that object. And, and it functions. It has a function to, to control a quantum computer, for example. And a, interesting, the, the way that Forrest actually was introduced to the team was to do just that. We had just completed this really nice custom control electronics for our quantum computer. And we had a kind of celebration for the team. Forrest came on and he painted these beautiful paintings of birds. So we call the collection of our control electronics, we call that an aviary. And so each one of the different control electronics, so there's like a heron board and that does a specific function. And there's a, an eagle board, right? Which has a specific function. And what Forrest did was he painted live while everyone was there doing the meeting, right? With this huge all hands meeting, he painted live these beautiful pictures of these birds. And now these are up, you know, in the, in our lab celebrating again, this idea of an aviary, but all of these birds are corresponding to people's work. I mean, I have people who like, you know, stand up next to that and like have taken pictures next to the bird. Yeah. With it's the, exciting. The board that they created, right. It's beautiful. So now I have another question. Can we see those pictures? Yes. We have some really nice pictures of the paintings that okay. we will share so, with the audience. Great. So we will have it as well on the show notes. I love it. The point uh, you just mentioned, because I think it brings another flavor to art in the world of uh, business or workspaces that you actually make your own employees happy or proud about their own work or see it in a different light. So yes. that's, I think it's another beautiful aspect. And Eric, I'm interested, you are a scientist and you have obviously passion for the arts and mm -hmm. you yourself using photography. I'm interested, what are the similarities that you see between artist and scientist? And then maybe what are the differences? I see them as very similar, especially the, the space that, you know, the creative minds, right? I think you have a very similar process where you need these, you know, uninterrupted deep thought, you know, kind of moments to really get into your craft. I see in both cases, the similarity of getting things done, like actually creating objects or artifacts or even performances, even if they're ethereal like that, for like a performance, um, those are, you're completing a task, you're completing something and a scientist or engineer, like that's an important part of being able to complete an experiment. Um, my oldest sister is a, is a chef. She's an executive chef and has, as we've tracked our careers, I've noticed the similarities in our career. I can call her and basically we drop into conversations and it seems like we're living a very similar life, even though she is in, you know, the, the hot place making food, amazing food. And, you know, and I'm in a, I'm in a lab, you know, creating, you know, a quantum computer. And the, the similarities there to me are there's more similarities in there. I think there are differences in my mind. And if you have, if you were to mention one difference, what is the difference <laughs> you, you would say? Well, I think one difference, I'll, I'll see if this is a difference. So let's go down this track. So I think about there's a lot around these, sometimes we say the words like a bespoke or artisanal kind of craft and artisanal has the word art in it, right? you know, these are kind of these very unique one-off things. Well, in what we're trying to do and what a lot of scientists and engineers try to do is they try to show that we can make it more than just once, right? That we can actually make it a bunch of times and make it better every time. And sometimes an artist, and same with a scientist too, I guess, but sometimes an artist might be like, I've made that once, I don't need to make it again, yeah. right? So again, I almost see that still as a similarity, but there are these unique aspects that you want in engineering and science sometimes to then show that you can make things reliable and better over time. So I have maybe another kind of a question. I want you to recommend the scientists that listening to us, why they should engage with art if they are still not convinced after all this <laughs> conversation. Because one of the things that, you know, I always say that at least for me, artists, entrepreneurs, and scientists are very similar in the way they do things and the way they think. But still, our education system, our work environment are very siloed. In a way, the entrepreneurs and scientists are much closer because science is the core of innovation. But artists are kind of 
out there. It's nice to have. It's not must have. And one of the things that I get excited is when I meet people like you that understand that science is important, but we cannot lose the connection to our humanity, which is the arts. So why a scientist should engage with art, should get to know artists? List a bunch of reasons. The first one that comes to mind is the ability to inspire and tell your story, to actually be able to give some kind of narrative to the work that you're doing. That is always really, really well done by an artist. That's one. So being able to educate, explain to you know a, a broader audience, to reach more people about what it is that you're doing. And now that can look from a scientist's point of view, hey, you need to get funding to do your science, to do your work, right? How well are you actually telling the story of what it is that you're doing and the impact that it has on humanity, right? And artists can help with that. I talked about it earlier about the inspiration that it brings to the team and the others that are working in the lab together, right? And uh, these different views. I think as we look back at 2020 as a year that we all went to our, our artists to make it through this year, whether it was the music, we used to go to you know these amazing <laughs> live performances and we just don't have those right now. So what did we fall back to? Right? We, we listened to those albums that you know changed our lives, right? We listened, we read the books that all of these things that these are artistic creations that were very important to the inspiration and getting us through 2020. And I love to think about how that's going to propel us forward, right? Great. One last question. When will we see a quantum computer function? <laughs> well, let me be specific and say we have a quantum computer functioning today. That was the Sycamore processor that we talked about earlier. And what we're driving towards is this idea of an error-corrected quantum computer. Um, so I talked, we had this yeah. whole mouthful of a noisy <laughs> intermediate scale quantum computer. Um, that is where we are today. And we want to get to this error-corrected, fault-tolerant, error-corrected quantum computer. I believe that's within the decade. It's 10 years out, maybe even see it before 2030. And that is what we're doing at Google. We're trying to build towards an error-corrected quantum computer within the decade. And that's, you can think about some important parts there are these ideas that we have the first kind of digital component of a quantum computer is this, you know, forever qubit. And once we show that we can build a forever qubit, we just have to, you know, copy and paste that a bunch of times. Like I said, these engineers really love to do, then make it a bunch of times really good. And with that, we'll have an error-corrected quantum computer, and we can start to solve some of these exciting problems that I had talked about earlier in the show. Eric, first of all, good luck on this uh, mission. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I'm positive that uh, uh, with this energy and this not losing sight about our humanities, it's a great place to be. Thank you very, very much for taking the time to share all this information and for bringing art into the world of science. Because again, I would say it, that behind every creative and innovative company or department, there is a first name and a last name. And I'm fortunate and grateful to speak with Eric Lucero, the first name and last name in Google Quantum Computing. Thank you very much, Nir. It's really a pleasure talking with you and thank you for having me. I have to admit, it took me some time until I got this quantum computing concept. I was fortunate to speak with Eric a few times to learn about it. And that's a, another opportunity to say thank you, Eric, for your generosity. His mission to deliver quantum computing tools to the world to enable humankind to solve problems that would otherwise be impossible is exciting. I found myself thinking about its potential, whether it is finding cures for diseases or reducing the impact on our planet. This technology sparks the imagination and working with artists to communicate these future solutions and explore the technological potential is something you should go check. The recordings you heard during the podcast are taken from the Google I.O. 2020 and 2021 keynotes from the Nature Magazine video and Egg's own thesis video. So I hope your imagination started working today. And until the next time, stay well. I will be here waiting for you with another episode of the Artian Podcast with me, Nir Hindi. Once again, thanks for listening.